because... Why do you think that this judge goes further than any other? That not only does he say this is the knife, not only does he say that you had it because of DNA around the bottom of the blade and the hilt, but that he believes you are the one who actually killed Meredith Kircher. I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear My mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Amanda Knox is in the news again. An Italian court, actually a court in Florence, is reviewing a four-page letter that Amanda wrote during a police interview to decide whether she defamed Patrick Lumumba. There is so much to say about the circumstances surrounding the writing of that letter But in this analysis, we're going to restrict ourselves simply to reading the four-page letter. We'll leave the analysis for the next video. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Bear in mind, I've written six books on the murder of Meredith Kirch. I'll put links to those in the description. Check those out. They are pretty well rated. If you're enjoying this analysis, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So this analysis is really going to be familiarizing ourselves with the transcript of Amanda's handwritten statement to police made on the evening of November 6th, the day she was arrested, and around about a week after Meredith's death. The context is actually quite simple. The police wanted to know, did she have an alibi? And it took around about a week for the police to decide what they felt was the truth of that matter. Do you have an alibi, yes or no? Well, the answer seemed to be, well, um, uh. Anyway, let's go through the transcript. We're not going to do any analysis here, but I do want you to perhaps take out a pen and notebook and take a few notes. The transcript is 1,635 words, three pages on a Word document, and you would think if you had an alibi, it would be quite simple to say, this is my alibi. What is quite interesting in Amanda's version of events here is she actually places herself at the scene and basically says, well, while I was there, this other individual was there too. What, how does that sound as an alibi? So that is the context very, very briefly. And now let's deal with this four-page letter that the court in Florence is also going to be examining. This is very strange, I know, but really what happened is as confusing to me as it is to everyone else. I have been told there is hard evidence saying that I was at the place of the murder of my friend when it happened. This, I want to confirm, is something that to me, if asked a few days ago, would be impossible. I know that Rafael has placed evidence against me, saying that I was not with him on the night of Meredith's murder, Meredith's murder. but let me tell you this. In my mind, there are things I remember and things that are confused. My account of the story goes as follows, despite the evidence stacked against me. On Thursday, November 1st, bear in mind this is five days later, I saw Meredith the last time at my house when she left around three or four in the afternoon. Raffaele was with me at the time. We, Raffaele and I, stayed at my house for a little while longer and around five in the evening, we left to watch the movie Amelie at his house. After the movie, I received a message from Patrick, for whom I work at the pub Le Chic. He told me in this message that it wasn't necessary for me to come into work for the evening, because there is no one at my work. Now, I remember to have also replied with the message, See you later, have a good evening. And this for me does not mean that I wanted to meet him immediately, in particular because I said good evening. What happened after, I know, does not match up with what Raffaele was saying, but this is what I remember. I told Raffaele that I didn't have to work and that I could remain at home for the evening. After that, I believed we relaxed in his room together. Perhaps I checked my email. 
Perhaps I read or studied or perhaps I made love to Raffaele. In fact, I think I did make love with him. However, I admit that this period of time is rather strange because I'm not quite sure. I smoked marijuana with him and I might even have fallen asleep. These things I'm not sure about and I know they are important to the case and to help myself. But in reality, I don't think I did much. One thing I do remember is that I took a shower with Raffaele and this might explain how we passed the time. In truth, I do not remember exactly what day it was, but I do remember that we had a shower and we washed ourselves for a long time. He cleaned my ears, he dried and combed my hair. One of the things I am sure that definitely happened the night on which Meredith was murdered was that Raffaele and I ate fairly late, I think around 11 in the evening, although I can't be sure because I didn't look at the clock. After dinner I noticed there was blood on Raffaele's hand, but I was under the impression that it was blood from the fish. After we ate, Raffaele washed the dishes, but the pipes under his sink broke and water flooded the floor. But because he didn't have a mop, I said we could clean it up tomorrow because we, Meredith, Laura, Philomena and I, have a mop at home. I remember it was quite late because we were both very tired, though I can't say the time. The next thing I remember was waking up the morning of Friday, November 2nd, around 10 a.m., and I took a plastic bag to take my dirty clothes to go back to my house. It was then that I arrived home alone that I found the door to my house was wide open and this all began. In regards to this confession that I made last night, I want to make clear that I'm very doubtful of the verity of my statements because they were made under the pressure of stress, shock and extreme exhaustion. Not only was I told I would be arrested and put in jail for 30 years, but I was also hit in the head when I didn't understand or when I didn't remember a fact correctly. I understand that the police are under a lot of stress, so I understand the treatment I received. However, it was under this pressure after many hours of confusion that my mind came up with these answers. In my mind, I saw Patrick in flashes of blurred images. I saw him near the basketball court. I saw him at my front door. I saw myself cowering in the kitchen with my hands over my ears because in my head I could hear Meredith screaming. But I've said this many times so as to make myself clear. These things seem unreal to me, like a dream. And I'm unsure if they are real things that happened or just dreams my head has made to try to answer the questions in my head and the questions I'm being asked. But the truth is, I'm unsure about the truth and here's why. Number one, the police have told me that they have hard evidence that place, places me at the house, my house, at the time of Meredith's murder. I don't know what proof they are talking about, but if this is true, it means I am very confused and my dreams must be real. 2. My boyfriend has claimed that I have said things that I know are not true. I know I told him I didn't have to work that night. I remember that moment very clearly. I also never asked him to lie for me. That is absolutely a lie. What I don't understand is why Raffaele, who has always been so caring and gentle with me, would lie about this. What does he have to hide? I don't think he killed Meredith, but I do think he is scared, like me. He walked into a situation that he has never had to be in, and perhaps he's trying to find a way out by disassociating himself with me. Honestly, I understand because this is a very scary situation. I also know that the police don't believe things of me that I know I can explain, such as 1. I know the police are confused as to why it took me so long to call someone after I found the door to my house open and blood in the bathroom. The truth is, I wasn't sure what to think, but I definitely didn't think the worst, that someone was murdered. I thought a lot of things, mainly that perhaps someone got hurt and left quickly to take care of it. I also thought that maybe one of my roommates was having menstrual problems and hadn't cleaned up. Perhaps I was in shock, but at the time I didn't know what to think and that's the truth. That is why I talked to Raffaele about it in the morning, because I was worried and wanted advice. 2. I also know that the fact that I can't fully recall the events that I claim took place at Raffaele's home during the time that Meredith was murdered is incriminating, and I stand by my statements that I made last night about events that could have taken place in my home with Patrick, but I want to make very clear that these events seem more unreal to me 
that what I said before, that I stayed at Raffaele's house, I think she meant to say then, then what I said before. Number three, I'm very confused at this time. My head is full of contrasting ideas and I know I can be frustrating to work with for this reason. But I also want to tell the truth as best as I can. Everything I've said in regard to my involvement in Meredith's death, even though it is contrasting, are the best truth that I've been able to think. I'm trying, I really am, because I'm scared for myself. I know I didn't kill Meredith, that's all I know for sure. In these flashbacks that I'm having, I see Patrick as the murderer, but the way the truth feels in my mind, there's no way for me to have known because I don't remember for sure if I was at my house that night. The question that needs answering, at least for, for how I'm thinking, are one, why did Raffaele lie? Or for you, did Raffaele lie? Two, why did I think of Patrick? Three, is the evidence proving my presence at the time and place of the crime reliable? If so, what does this say about my memory? Is it reliable? Four, is there any other evidence condemning Patrick or any other person? Three, well, it goes from four back to three. Who is the real murder? This is particularly important because I don't feel I can be used as condemning testimony in this instance. Quite interesting, there's some spelling mistakes next to the wrong number. I have a clearer mind that I've had before. I think that should also be then, but I'm still missing parts, which I know is bad for me. But this is the truth, and this is what I'm thinking at this time. Please don't yell at me because it only makes me more confused which doesn't help anyone. I understand how serious the situation is, and as such, I want to give you this information as soon and as clearly as possible. If there are still parts that don't make sense, please ask me. I'm doing the best I can, just like you are. Please believe me at least in that, although I understand if you don't. All I know is that I didn't kill Meredith, and so I have nothing but lies to be afraid of. And that's where the letter ends. I'll put a link in the description if you want to read this on your own time. What I want to ask you now is uh, three questions. Number one, and you can answer these questions in the, in the comments. Number one, do you trust the veracity of this letter? In other words, just in general, do you feel it's believable? Then number two, do you think an allegation is made against Patrick? And then number three, if you think there is an allegation against Patrick, do you think it rises to the level of deliberate um, de uh, defamation, basically deliberately accusing him of a crime? Or do you think that you could say she, w she was confused? Please uh, leave your answers in the comments and also let me know if you'd like me to do analysis on this based on my knowledge and my research. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.